Hey guys, I'm digital anchor Brandy Smith, and today marks 53 years since we stepped foot on the moon. Obviously not us, but since humans stepped foot on the moon. I'm gonna pull up some video from, you know, just a, just a half a century ago. It's wild to think about it, right? In the lead up to this mission, Apollo 11, uh, and in the years that followed, Houston really built a reputation as Space City. And so my question for you guys today is now that we see launches happening, well, most of the launches happened in Cape Canaveral, and, and now anything with SpaceX is happening out of Brownsville, how, how do we reclaim Space City? I think it helps that we have Johnson Space Center here and we have Space Center Houston you can go and visit and it just inspires that next generation in a big way. But uh, I remember when I did a story um, on the anniversary of the shuttle missions retiring and uh, the sentiment from, from someone who worked on the shuttles was that um, people got bored with it. It, w it became so commonplace that people got bored with the idea of the shuttle missions, um, even the ISS. And so for years, we went without one. Then you have SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, other private companies launching um, with the intent of tourism, space tourism. But that's not happening here in Houston. It's helping with the help of some of the know-how and experience from Houston. Ah, Mark just commented, don't forget Ellington Spaceport. Yes, so that is in development. But how, how do we get Space City back? While we have that discussion, I wanna go through some of the stories that we've done in the past, especially those we did three years ago on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. Um, I'm gonna start with this story from Ron Trevino, who was talking to a uh, space historian. So they came down in the Sea of Tranquility, or Mare Tranquilatus. Robert Perlman would love to go to the moon, but for now, he settles for being a space historian. Apollo 11, Houston, we are go for undocking, over. Roger, understand. Perlman's expertise and knowledge is why the director of the Apollo 11 documentary turned to him as a consultant to keep things historically accurate. A few months into the project, they got an email from someone at the National Archives that would change everything. He was definitely excited in this email saying that he had found this stash of 70 millimeter or large format, people know it as IMAX format, film that was labeled Apollo 11, had no idea what was on it, but were we interested? Go, Fido, go, guide, go, control, go. It turned out to be a hidden gem, never before seen high quality film of the mission. It is as clear and crisp and colorful as anything that you could shoot with today's modern cameras. The six minute mark in our countdown for Apollo 11, now five minutes, 52 seconds. The result leaves the viewer feeling like this didn't happen 50 years ago, Instead, that it's happening right now. We have some 7.6 million pounds of thrust pushing the vehicle upward. The film also shows the crowd, an estimated 1 million people who traveled to Florida to see the launch for themselves. In the crowd, a lot of VIPs and celebrities, Vice President Agnew, and The Tonight Show's Johnny Carson. One of the brilliant things that the cameraman did back then was that they turned the cameras on the people. So we get to see this slice of life from 1969. Eagle Houston, everything's looking good here, over. Roger, copy. It keeps you on the edge of your seat, even though you know the ending, in what many consider man's greatest achievement. I hope that Apollo 11, um, the film, will inspire us to Rem or remind us as a nation that when we put our minds together and we work together, that we can achieve just about anything, everything. Inspiration from 50 years ago, calling mankind forward again. You can watch that Apollo 11 documentary um, on a number of streaming services if you are so inclined. Watching this video, watching the astronauts assemble this flag. A key part of that is the flag pole, right? 
Well, back in 2019, reporter Larry Seward talked to the man who came up with the idea. You must be Dr. Parr. Well, I am. Home in Richmond, Texas, long retired. This is my command center. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you call it, really? It's what I call it. <laughs> it's mine. 89-year-old mechanical engineer Ken Parr. That's a, a safe. Is still an invent, fix up anything kind of guy. Oh, that is so cool. With out of this world creations, including the one still in orbit, he thinks. Trump said that he's going to send another team up there to the moon to see if the flag is still in the moon. Well, I can tell him that it is and save that money. Apollo 11, mankind's giant leap, planted America's flag on the moon and with it. Beautiful, just beautiful. Ken Parr's creation. A lot of our stuff came out on stamps. In 1953, between mechanical engineering classes at the University of Houston, Parr worked for a company called ESCO. Both believed NASA was on to something big and wanted in. They tackled jobs at the Astrodome and Astroworld to prove their worth. Parr's machinist work caught their eye. You see, ever since he molded that meat cleaver from aluminum in high school shop, this stuff felt like his calling. It's making something from almost nothing, making something that's beautiful, that's useful, that fills a need for whatever you need at the time. In the height of the space race, NASA called ESCO often. We had to have 20 men on call at any given time to do anything they needed done, day or night. But their biggest ask, 70, 75 aircraft aluminum, to build a flagpole for the first lunar landing, we had to make everything as light as possible. Proved easy and life-changing. That inspired me to do more. Parr's company made poles for Apollo 16, 17. They worked on the lunar rover and made the parasol that saved Skylab, NASA's first space station. How do you do something bigger than that? Presidents personally write to congratulate Parr and his wife of 70 years every wedding anniversary. Now owner of an honorary doctorate, he's building safes by the pile, mostly for people to lock up weapons, his response to a child suicide close to his family. Selling them is the next step for a man used to reaching for the stars. In Richmond, Larry Seward, KJU, 11 News. How amazing would that be to be able to point to that old footage from the moon and say, hey, kids, grandkids, great grandkids, I was a part of that. Um, my grandfather worked for a company called Aerojet in Sacramento during the Apollo era, and they worked on a lot of the pieces and parts that went into um, some of those missions, including, um, I want to say it was the, the blasters on the rover that helped the Apollo 13 astronauts get back home. Um, and that's just always been a fun piece of our family history, so I can imagine it's the same for his. Now I want to introduce you to a Sugarland seventh grader who uh, very similarly will, will have a story to tell. Right now it's just a brag to his friends, but Xavier Walton shares this story. Wow. Meet Grayson. He's your typical 12 year old, but after Tuesday, he's got a really cool, not so typical story to tell his friends. So I was like, well, it's got a like message from a rover on Mars. He was one of 20 kids in the entire country awarded for his perseverance by NASA's Perseverance mission team. Catch on confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. The agency faced and overcame its own hurdles to get the Perseverance rover to Mars during the pandemic. They want students to do the same. He's just been working really hard. That's exactly why Mrs. Bedner nominated Grayson. Being able to push through obstacles and really just persevering in everything that he's doing. The message from the Mars rover read, carve your own path and push onward. Keep striving for excellence. So cool. It's crazy. Grayson, smiling ear to ear, has overcome so many obstacles in his short life. We asked him to share some. Growing up, I was in a foster care. Um, most of the families were like really abusive. I got adopted when I was seven. Um, April 21st, 2017 on my birthday, which is really cool. Fast forward to 2022 at Sugarland Middle School. You could say he's persevering. Mm, <laughs> a little bit. And carving his own path. <laughs> I can't even explain it. Xavier Walton, KHOU 11 News.
I want to end with that video of Mars that he's showing there and from the Perseverance rover, because that's the next mission, right? We're trying to go to Mars. There, There is a mission also to get back to the moon, but, uh, you know, kind of the next spot that we're trying to explore is Mars. And um, the idea is to send people there. We got to figure out how they could live there first. And it turns out you could help if you live here in Houston. Here's Xavier again. NASA always aims for the stars, but training starts on the ground inside the Johnson Space Center. Let's go check it out. As NASA journeys farther into the cosmos. My background is in space architecture. Space architecture? It's design of extraterrestrial habitats. How cool is that? It's amazing, it's pretty rad, yeah. <laughs> Minds like Melody Yashar's have never been more important. She's the director of building design and performance at ICON, the Texas company NASA called on creating a Mars habitat at the Johnson Space Center. It is a dream project and it's as close as we can get to what a real kind of Martian scenario would actually be. So this is it, Mars Dune Alpha, at least the unfinished product. It'll be a 3D printed red planet habitat. That red stuff? Lava creep. It'll be done in a few months. We move very quickly, and that's one of the um, incredible affordances of 3D printing. And um, we're going to have a hand at play for what our future Martian missions are going to look like. The inside of the 1700 square foot module might look like this. So the idea is that you would send a robot to Mars before the crew arrives. It would print your habitat, print the infrastructure of, a, of an initial settlement, and then the crew would actually have a place to sort of take shelter in when they when they actually get there. Do you have any plans to go to Mars? <laughs> Not today. <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> All jokes aside, this could be your address for the next year. The first crew is actually uh, scheduled to call this place home fall of 2022. NASA's looking for some highly motivated individuals. Xavier Walton, KHOU 11 News. Ah, uh, Mark, just had that whole conversation with myself. I'm sorry, thank you, Mark, for letting me know. Um, I was talking about uh, Icon, the company that did the 3D printing for the Mars Habitat for NASA, is also a company I profiled this last November when we, want, when we launched Living in the Lone Star. Um, sorry, now all the no sound comments are coming in. I got it, I got it, I turned it back on. I'm so sorry, you guys. Uh, but this company, um, has done a, a residential neighborhood in um, Austin, also uh, communities for families in need uh, in Austin and then in Mexico. And it, as of November, had announced, I think it was a hundred home subdivision. Um, that's all gonna be 3D printed. So use um, here on earth and on Mars. <laughs> Frederick says, Shaq said the moon's closer than LA because when he is in Atlanta, he can see the moon, but not California. All right. Uh, but I'm curious, now that we have a few more of you and I can see you engaging with, with us in the comments, um, when, when I say space city, what do you think of? I think if you live in Houston and you've lived here for any amount of time, your immediate thought is Houston. But outside of Houston, Nowadays, 
Cape Canaveral, Brownsville. Shoot, um, what's the town in West Texas where Blue Origin launched? Um, yeah, Mark says he, he Im immediately thinks of NASA. Do you think of Houston, NASA? Do you think of the Johnson Space Center? Or do you think of Kennedy over in Florida? We did, I feel like we need, we need a little bit more activity here. And, and Mark's early comment about Ellington Spaceport, that could make a difference for sure. Um, this doesn't have a huge amount to do with, with Houston, but last week we, we got to see the first images from the James Webb Telescope. And it's just, they are incredible. Xavier, can you tell he's our space reporter? Xavier Walton uh, talked to someone who came to Houston for a special training to make sure that this telescope was going to work. Liftoff from a tropical rainforest. The James Webb Space Telescope launched Christmas Day, and scientists say it's the gift that'll keep giving for generations. Little taste, tip of the iceberg. Tuesday, the world clamoring over cosmic cliffs, displaying hot ionized gas in an interstellar cloud. An incredible image of a dense white dwarf star, and this, a group of five galaxies from far, far away. It was a combination of giddy in the room, looking at the data. Oh my God, this is great. So Randy, you've been working with JWST since 2009. So when you see these incredible images for the first time, what was your reaction? Whew. So this was complicated. Randy Kimball worked on telescope testing. We would spend months round the clock with the payload in giant vacuum chambers. That specific testing Randy is talking about happened in Houston at the Johnson Space Center in 2017. JWST was inside Chamber A for more than 100 days. We tested straight through Hurricane Harvey. Through it all, more than 20,000 people from 29 states and 14 countries developed a powerful telescope. What new phenomena does Webb uncover? Do you believe in aliens? There are so many stars and planets that you would have a chance for life to develop that I think it's very likely. Of course, Xavier had to get that last question in there. Uh, I wanted to share these comments from Mark. His dad was a simulator instructor uh, in the early 60s until the 80s, and he says he used to play out there when I was growing up. That's pretty cool, playing out there. Um, just seeing the way Clear Lake built up and didn't, didn't really exist before NASA. Um, and now, you know, I'm told that's there where the uh, astronauts go to retire. So it only looks like there are 10 of you watching right now, and I appreciate you having tuned in throughout this. Uh, you, can, you can go ahead and continue to leave questions, comments, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up. Have a wonderful day. Remember, you can stream us anytime on our app, which you can find on Roku and Fire TV. You can also watch our videos on YouTube and Facebook. Have a great day, guys.